And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Tony Rodriguez, secret space program experiencer and author of the book Series Colony Cavalier. Tony, thank you for joining me today and welcome. Jeffrey, hello. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm a pleasure to be here. Can we just first start with what is the Secret Space Program and how did you get involved in it? Um, yeah, that's okay. So just just that. <laughs> uh, it's uh, hard to encompass in, in quickly uh, or in one paragraph. The Secret Space Program is actually a, a collage of many organizations that have access to deep space, uh, you know, far beyond what we are led to believe publicly with rockets or just the low earth orbit uh, space programs that we think are all that there is. In fact, <clears throat> early on, you know, it's my my theory and what I've always said was that World War One was about money and World War Two was about uh, interstellar flight. Hmm. And they had discovered through uh, kind of a long story in itself, but um, Axis powers and the Europe, uh, the the Deutsch culture um the the post nazis had discovered space flight through via anti gravity back then and even though they lost the war um they had won the doorway to space and they went into space and made allies and began to colonize the solar system and nearby stars and very shortly after that the soviets and the united states went into space and made allies and began to colonize the solar system and travel to the stars and begin trading with extraterrestrials uh, from all over. And it turns out that um, we're not only are we not alone, but we are, it's teeming with life, intelligent life that has a huge economy and infrastructure and um, culture that is in our solar system and beyond. And then it's very, space is not only um, accessible, but very close, uh, very, very distant parts of space. Are, and they're all been trading with each other once there's a level of technology. Anyhow, so the space programs are secretive. Uh, some of them are corporate owned groups of corporations that have access to space. Some of them were the early governments or fractions of uh, fragments of governments. And it's turned into something else. So now there's there's an entire infrastructure of underground bases and off world bases in the moon. The back of the moon has bases and they have access to exotic and very wild technology, including time travel, consciousness transference, radical medical technology, um, not only faster than light travel, but instantaneous travel beyond the galaxy. So there's a lot of technology that we are kept in the dark and we've essentially become a resource for these programs to take not only people, but re but material so that they can trade with off-world species for technology. I have thought about anti-gravity quite a bit because I would love to have, you know, anti-gravity cars you know, cruising around the city and around the planet. Do you know how it works? So I was told that it was a um, combination of exotic elements that we don't have access to here on Earth, that it's a very easy thing to do. Um, in my book, Series Colony Cavalier, I describe what I went through, and I would warn anybody reading the book that it's not a PG book. It's uh, There were some very terrible things that happened, especially in the first half, and uh, it's very adult. And um, it's not an easy read emotionally, even though towards the end of the book, it kind of it kind of planes out. Um, that being said, it kind of details. I was taken into this into a secret space program uh, kind of through the side door. I wasn't somebody that was groomed for it. So maybe I am so I'm an anomaly for what happened to me. I wasn't somebody that these programs typically take. And maybe that's why I got my memories back to the uh, the way that I do. But um, I was taken, and then I lived on Earth for a period for what was called a 20 and back or a career return program, where they take you and either clone and transfer your consciousness or use other means of age regression at the end of it. And uh, they took me for 20 years. They took me on a on a went on a Thursday night, excuse me. They took me on a Thursday night, and I lived for 20 years. I grew up from 10 years old to 30 years old. Then they put me back in my original body, put me back in time. And I woke up the next morning so disoriented. Are you, so are you saying that they cloned your body and then transferred your consciousness to the new body? So, yeah. So I, I'm not a hundred percent on that to be, I mean, to be, to be bluntly honest, um, I had procedures done to me and I was 
the victim of it. So I don't know exactly what was happening. So when I look back on it or, you know, rewind my memories and the way that things worked out, that's, that's my best guess. Um, that I was cloned. And then in order to drive the clone, they took, I experienced the 20 years in space first and then went back to the same day, the same age, and then lived my life till now. <clears throat> I was changed. I was a different person the next morning when I woke up and mm -hmm. I had amnesia. I had no, you know, I felt like I had been gone for that span of time and I had no idea what, why, what was going on. Um, but fast forward to 2015, I got an MRI scan of my head and a couple of weeks later, I got all the memories back. I found out about the technology and I always had bleed through memories of being taken and, and time and space <clears throat> time up there. And I always told myself, when did that happen? And then when the memories came back, when I accepted the fact that they took me not only for one night or a couple times, they took me for 20 years in one, in one go, and then had the technology to put me back the same day. And this is really kind of fits the uh, phenomenon for a lot of people that are taken or they have contact and they don't know what, I don't know what happened. I just felt different. You know, when I was back, I, no memories, it kind of fits like a glove of how they would do that and why. So I was taken and I was slave labor. I was privately owned in the beginning and I was shuffled from black project to black project until I was sold off to the space program. And I went into space, went to the back of the moon and then to Mars and then ultimately to the Ceres colony, which is a planetoid in between Mars and the asteroid belt. And, uh, but back to your question about gravity. So the series planetoid had artificial gravity plating, grav map, grav, grav map, um, plating, which I call it gravity plating. But uh, some friends of mine reminded me that it was grav mats. Um, but they had artificial gravity and they could turn it up and down. And um, the thing is, the manipulation of gravity, the physics behind that really opened the door to all the other technologies, the free energy uh, even even the time travel, the physics of the time traveling. Uh, and so that's something that that's why we don't have anti-grav cars right now, because it's really the linchpin to all the other technology that in the wrong hands would be quite effective or dangerous. So I'm not, I'm not making excuses for the secrecy, but I'm saying that that is one factor in in that is that the physics behind gravity manipulation open the door it's almost like nuclear energy where it opens the door to bombs and other things that are dangerous so it's kind of like that but we're close um i recently did a conference a tech conference in silicon valley and there were people there that are that's their full-time job is um researching gravity and trying to reverse engineer without one in hand but watching the videos of uaps and they're trying to figure out the physics behind it and They've actually, they're actually much farther along than you would think. They're, mm -hmm. they're able to change, you know, on a very slight way, they're actually able to change gravity readings in a laboratory setting. So they're not, uh, they're not exactly doing anti-grav, but they are manipulating gravity already. So the physics are come moving quite along. So we may get a discovery soon in our lifetime, just or naturally without, without any ET help. In Bob Lazar's story, he talks about this element that was I guess questionable, but now they've proven it exists, but in an unstable form. Do you think that's the element that we need? I don't believe so. I think there are other elements. So I was told that a lot of the elements, not only for the anagraph, but for the power system. So the name of the game when I was in Ceres Colony and for the ships up there wasn't so much the technology, it was power output. In other words, a ship with a greater power output would defeat a ship with lesser power output. Like it would have, it could go faster A to B, it could jump farther, create a larger wormhole and jump farther, and it could produce greater weaponry at a distance. So it was, it was all about power output. And the larger free energy engines, generators, were had exotic elements that are found towards the center of the galaxy where there's a greater star forming uh, cycle mm -hmm. so that those elements get, you know, stars form and makes make elements and they full collapse and then other stars and it happens again so that cycle happens a lot more uh, rapidly in the center towards the middle of the galaxy so that's the region they had to trade with ets that had that lived there indigenously so it was something so there's still you know even though they can synthesize many things they could uh you know star trek called it a replicator they could synthesize food and other things they couldn't do all the elements but i i believe that that's that there are a combination of elements maybe in conjunction with element 115 that he said that um achieved that result 
It's great that you mentioned consciousness because we talk about it a lot here on our channel, especially with near-death experiencers, sometimes on the other side, not only seeing angels or Jesus or God encounter beings that could be considered aliens. Sometimes I theorize that maybe a lot of aliens don't really exist in our realm, but exist in that conscious realm and pop out into our realm. Have you had any experience with that? Absolutely. So, whew, uh, so from the top, in the first <clears throat> position that I was in was in um, contraband smuggling, and I traced it back, the funding of it. I found the, the place where it happened and uh, put a lot together from what I remember. So I was taken at 10 years old and I was immediately put in a trauma-based mind control program that led in, that morphed into a remote viewing program where they were essentially drugging us. They were bringing up, putting, giving kids, uh, we'd get an IV and they would drug us and we'd be near death and we would channel other intelligences so they could ask us questions. They were getting business advice. I was on shipments in South America of contraband and they were using me as a security system. So they'd ask other police up there, what's the weather, which way do we go left or right? And it wasn't me. It was other intelligences that were speaking through me. So I was near death at that point. And that these were monthly trips. This went on for like two years, almost two years monthly that this happened to me. And it's actually going to be a great deal of the subject matter of my second book that I'm working on. But um, during that time, Quite a bit happened. So I just leave it like that. I, I want to leave that open ended, but absolutely. So, and it turns out that we all are, you know, ultimately a consciousness once, once you leave your body, like the, the science of it, I, you probably heard of uh, stalking the wild pendulum. Actually, I have, I, I have Isaac Benthal. So this, this is a, it's a free PDF that's out on the internet. And he was a Russian scientist back in, I think the fifties or sixties. I got, don't quote me on that, but that he described quantum physics, but he really went into the science of consciousness. And it was the basis of the CIA experiments, the Project Grill Flame that went to Center Lane, Project Center Lane and Project Gateway. The basis of these experiments was based on his work. And uh, in a nutshell, your thought patterns are an electron or a photon that bounce back and forth and that we are living in a quantum hologram with the smallest pixel being about a Planck distance. And the electrons uh, are very fine in that are consciousness. Conscious thought is a form of electricity that is very fine. And when the electrons bounce back and forth in a in a rolling wave, they they obey the laws of physics and stay inside our 3D quantum holograph state. But when you get a really high frequency where the where the the electron, if you will, I don't, I don't know if I'm using the right terminology, but the electron starts to bounce and change direction very quickly. It actually squashes and changes direction inside less than a Planck distance. So that electron for that, for that very time when it changes direction and starts to go down, clicks out of space time. And that's when you get access to the ESP, the remote viewing. That's the science behind it, is that you click out and there are electrons out there that you access that is basically uh, uh, outside of time space. So you can access past and future events or great distances away. But that's really the the science of how it works. It was like when I when I when I saw that I um I was blown away. What and the whole reason I discovered all that was I was researching what I had remembered going through and my own experiences. So with that being said, I found a lot of the things that from the original training and the original, you know, I found the paper trail, the funding trail, a, a lot. There was a lot of things that supported my testimony that I found on the CIA declassified library.gov website. And uh, those are some of the things. So consciousness um, is a science that's uh, hidden from us, if you will, that actually involves us greatly. So there's a lot of things that uh, we all experience that we're, we just ignore. I, it's, it's crazy to me that even though, even the most layman's term people, people have, people have so much precognition or intuitive things that happen that are so improbable. And when it happens, they just shrug it off. They go back to the life like, eh, nothing happened. I guess I got lucky. Yeah. I saved, I saved Aunt Margaret's life. I just, yeah. for some reason, I thought to call the caller and her house was burning. I, it's weird. You know, that happens all the time. It happens to everybody all the time. And people just ignore it because they're unaware of the science behind it, that the science is real, that everybody has a, a measure of 
ESP or psychic ability. And uh, some people are better at it. Some people work at it. There are things you can do to be better at it. It's just like playing, ba- everybody can play basketball kind of thing. And uh, some people are better at it than others because they put the work in. Since the distances are so far from Earth to wherever, I figure that there's two ways that they're traveling, either through a wormhole or the ship can kind of create some kind of bubble and then put itself in that other realm that thought exists and travel at the speed of thought and then pop back out. What do you know with your experience how they're making those distances? So I worked on several ships. I did about 12 years that I was, um, you know, I started out as ship maintenance uh, for the Series Colony Corp. And uh, I was there about 12 years. So I spent about eight years on one ship where, where I had no access to where I didn't even know if we were moving. To be, uh, to be honest, I was maintenance downstairs, down in the down in the bowels of the ship with no window. And I would show up and they'd let me in and I'd, I'd do what the computer told me. And at the end of the day, I'd go back to my barracks. I eventually, that ship got um, decommissioned and I was promoted to a cargo engineer where I got to sit in on mission briefings and had I, had, I was on a more modern ship. And, um, you know, anyhow, I was aware that that ship, the modern, the one that I was on, that I finished my, my tour on had three mode, three engines, if you will, it had three modes of transportation. One was an, uh, anti-grav based A to B where it could fly very, very fast. And we went from, well, it depended on the orbit. Cause we went to Jupiter. There are, there is a great deal of infrastructure among uh, extraterrestrial races around Jupiter. So, and there are also uh, natural tears in in time space where Jupiter is a failed star. So there are natural bubbles around there that are temporal bubbles and they can use some of them to travel. And that was one mode that was actually how they used to go extra galactic or outside of the galaxy. The ship could make its own, I, I I hate the word portal, I hate a wormhole, uh, you know, but basically it would make its own portal. And according to power output was how far it could go. So our, the ship that I was on was basically a cargo trade ship and uh, it was it was smaller, a lot smaller than the battleships. And it could go about a fifth of the distance of the galaxy across the galaxy in one jump. And then it would have to sit and recharge for 30 minutes and then it could jump again. So that's how we w- would go around the galaxy, which is a very big place for it to leave the galaxy. It had to use uh, the, the other mode and it would go into a natural uh portal a natural tear in time space and uh, create its jump nearby and then it could go to the one around jupiter i think gave us access to something like 18 galaxies and then from there it could find another natural portal and go to 18 more and so on and then uh yeah and then the like i said so it had an a to b flight it had its own method of jumping which was you know inside the galaxy kind of other star systems in our galaxy and then the third mode was to use a natural port, uh, natural uh, anomaly and then go much farther. So that was how it, and each, each jump, the jump and the anomaly, according to power output, not only could it go far, let's say a fifth of the distance across the galaxy, but it had a span of time where it could go in forward or backwards in time as well. So it could jump and go, you know, let's say a thousand light years and it could also go and it was limited. It would give it a thousand years in the past or a thousand years in the future. They could manipulate. We left, we would regularly leave. They called them anti-telephoning missions. And I did the math on it. And when I went back, there's a lot of things, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to explain quickly, but um, we would leave at seven in the morning. We would leave at eight in the morning, for instance, and I'm just throwing a number out there. We'd leave at eight in the morning and we would return at 7.55 in the morning, five minutes before we left, so that they knew that the mission was successful or not. So if the, we didn't come back on that time, they would scrub the mission and we wouldn't go and they wouldn't lose the ship. So it was anti-telephoning. We would go and be gone for six to eight hours and make four or five stops. Sometimes we went to five, six worlds in one day. And then we would come back and it would be the full day. And I would come back and we'd have to clean or go to school. They'd send us to classes to operate equipment and and then go back. So, and then series colony was on like a 20 hour day or something like that. 20 and a half hours. They had a shorter day than, than on earth. And it was, it was, everything was underground. So people go, what was there air on series? It's, it's a weird question. I get a lot, but everything was underground. It, these are huge underground bases. We're talking about something like a quarter million people living inside the planetoid and in small pockets of towns 
uh, infrastructure that are connected with trains, high speed trains between them. So you had this 20 year tour of duty, basically. And then when you returned, you basically time traveled back to where you left off, like 10 minutes later or something like that, right? Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. And and so my adult body, that's why I think I was the other thing is that the memories in the beginning, when I was taken, I was taken by ETs and I was thrilled. I thought it was first kind. I thought I was going to we're going to get ETs the next day. It was disclosure. And, um, you know, I agreed with them. I kind of went along. They said I wasn't in any danger and they kind of gave me a pack of lies. And, uh, when I woke up for the training, like I said, it was, you know, I was in still in a pro in an offshoot of project grill flame in California, in annual current California. I've found the place since then. That's what's, um, but unfortunate for me is when it comes to proving my memories, my account is that those first six years or so on earth, there were places that I went that I can also prove that I never went in this life. You know, that since I was born, I lived in Michigan, I grew up in Michigan and, you know, I'd go back though, but I've never been to Seattle or Inyo Kern, California or Peru. But those places that I lived during the 20 years, during those first six years, I knew my way around them and this is something i could prove so it was a form of it was a bullet point of of substantiating evidence it was a big deal um anyhow i went to california and i had no memory of where i came from so when i woke up when i began the 20 years i had complete amnesia i had no idea who mom and dad were or where i came i had no i had complete amnesia as if it were a new body and that's why i that's kind of and then you would think that all my memories would be deleted if they if I had amnesia. But I lived those 20 years. And at the very end, they sent me back to a base on the moon. And I went through another round of procedures. And it really felt like they killed me. And when I woke up back in my original body, I had all my memories back of mom and dad and where I lived, where I grew up in Michigan, my original memories back. And I had lost the memories of the 20 years. If that makes sense. It was as if I was put back in my original body. And I, there have been other people that have come forward with stories of kind of um, being taken by the same forms, kinds of organizations, and in fact, having consciousness transference happen. So there are other people, I'm not the only one. Um, so that's my best guess is why that's what I mean. Like, if somebody if you go in for surgery on your spleen, that doesn't know, mean you know how to operate on a spleen afterwards, you have no idea what happened. And it was kind of like that for me. So I'm trying to put it together after having experienced it as best I can. And I believe that that kind of solves it because the, just because of the local memory issue. Um, I don't think that they erased my memories and then gave them back. I think that it was taking me out of a body and then I went back in time. And then when they put it back in time, which is totally in there, if you can travel great distances of space, you can travel, you can travel time. They put me back in time and then just killed the original body and my consciousness went back to its home where, where, you know, it's original body. It's worth being said that when I went to school the next day, I had forgot where the bathrooms were. And I was, you know, I was 10 years old in the 80s. So I didn't have the internet. I didn't have access to, you know, adult information, but I was a changed person. And I had, you know, uh, adult things happening to me that I didn't understand why. And mm -hmm. so it was because they were rigid, because the day before I was an adult. Well, even though if you're in a clone body, in my opinion, it doesn't matter about where your memories are because. I had uh, Dr. Alexander on as a guest, and I'm not sure if you know who he is, but he's the Harvard neurosurgeon who had a near-death experience. And we talked about another neurosurgeon's research where you can basically cut out any part of the brain and you will not lose long-term memory. You will only lose the ability to convert short-term into long-term. So ultimately, our long-term memories are stored up I think he Somewhere called else. it. Yeah, I think he called it the quantum hologram. But you know, like our higher self, or our complete self, or the cloud, or whatever. So when I came back and I had lost the memories of the twenty years, I had I believe that that was um, artificial. And I remember from what I remember of the system of wiping my memory. It wasn't a pill that they gave me. It was actually industrial strength hypnosis that they were putting me in different booths and different things. They were stimulating. Uh, parts of my brain and then programming me with like a like a really high um tech version of hypnosis i was being hypnotized to forget and to avoid the thoughts when they came up of memories and what happened was over time when things would happen and just for instance if i broke an arm up there 
at the same time myself down here would 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 feel a trauma like i would get depressed and not understand why i would always wonder to feel like i broke dream that i broke my arm and then i'd what, what is that and i kept having waking dreams and i call them that just so that people can understand what it was like it was like dreaming but it wasn't a dream uh and the easiest way to say it is that if you dream that you're walking on a beach and you become lucid you go how did i get here there's no memory of riding in a car to the beach because you, in fact, did not travel to the beach. You were instantly there because you were dreaming. So you go, how did I get here? How, where am I going? Oh, this is a dream because there, you're cut off from that. I was getting all through my life in 17 and in my 20s. And I was getting bits and pieces of working on a spaceship in space. And I would go, wait a minute, where, how did I get here? And I would remember riding the train and brushing my teeth and waking up in the barracks. And I would remember the day and when you know it was a memory it, it was the form of a memory but it was when i was just about to wake up you know i think when you're in your deepest conscious uh you know your highest focus state if some people call it you know right before you wake up like really when you're in your REM sleep that's when i was accessing those and they didn't make any sense to me and i thought to myself when could that have happened because i still had a chronological memory of when i started you know, my whole life. So I thought, man, there's no way I was ever on a spaceship. I'm, maybe I was taken, maybe I was taken again. And I'd always remembered the first like 30 minutes of the abduction. So those memories did never got really deleted. The first, the actual gray in my bedroom and carrying me out and then going to the laboratory where they were testing me and doing, did that procedure. Like those original memories, I never really forgot. How did you retrieve these memories? Ultimately? So in April of 2015, I was having bad headaches. And, and I will say that, I, like I said, I had bleed through memories. I had memories that didn't make sense. So I just brushed them off as maybe the past life or, you know, maybe it was just a vivid dream. I don't know. But they were not like dreams because, I, like I said, there was I could think about the memory and I could go back and forth. I could remember it. And so it just didn't make sense. And I just did. I just was in denial that they were that they were possible because I was remembering things like looking outside of a window at nebula or flying over the geysers of Enceladus or the geyser around Ceres. The Ceres um, planetoid has a geyser. Um, but in April of 15, so I got headaches and I went to the doctor. I got my physical, my yearly physical, and she said, let's do an MRI and just make sure. And so I got an MRI. And then about 10 days later, I came across someone called named Randy Kramer one of his interviews and he was explaining the 20 and back the 20 year tour you know he was explaining how they do it the quantum superfluid consciousness is how he called it and he said that they're taking people and they live for 20 years and then all of a sudden i thought to myself all those little bits and pieces or memories are i remembered the initial abduction and then it was fuzzy and then i had all these other memories of being different ages and things and i thought that's what happened to me oh my god and once i once i realized once i accepted it the rest of the memories came like they flooded in. Like, I mean, in the period of three days, I, re I retained, you know, 80% of the book of series colony Cavalier. If you read the book, it's actually quite a bit of uh, incidences that I remember. They all came at once. Like it was that kind of, this was, it was more than anything that I could dream up or imagine. It was more than anything that it was just too much. It's like and a massive so, download. Yes. Oh, in big chunks, years at a time in chunks. And it kept coming for months, for months, big, big chunks. I still remember things, but they're very minor now. Um, and I knew at that time, I thought, what am I going to do with this? When I, you know, and I, what I did was I got online, I started research. So I remembered places in Seattle and I went on Google and in Peru and I went on Google Earth and I went to Peru and I thought, no, no, it's down here. It's south of here. I remember it's over. I was like, oh, wow, there it is. And imagine finding some, imagine remembering a place on the earth that you're unaware even exists, you know, some remote town somewhere in the world in South America, a remote town that you, it's never been in the news. It's never been in any textbook that you've ever come across. You've never learned about it ever. And not only that you get memories of it now, but you have memories of living there, like intimately knowing your way around, knowing where the good fishing pond is, knowing the history of what the river is like, because it's got two colors that come together knowing where the rough side of town is and where the cafeteria is and where your house was like intimate memories. All of a sudden you get these memories and you go, wait, how is this possible? And then you go on Google earth 
and find that it's all real and look at it and go, oh, wow, there it is. That's what I experienced in 2015. I found the place in Inukern, California. I found the place in Seattle from the book and I went there. So I tried to go to Peru. I got a hold of my friend and I wanted to go there. And he said, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's come on down. And then he researched it for a couple of days and he got back and he said, there's no way you can go there as a gringo. There's illegal gold mining and there's the drug trade and you will get killed. There's a high probability that you'll get killed there. You cannot, there's no way. He's like, I can't go there. He's like, this is a very wild west area. He's like, we, we are not welcome there. And it, which is exactly what I remember of the place. Wow. Um, so I went to Seattle. I went back to the house in Seattle and, uh, I thought that it would be vague that the memories wouldn't be super accurate. And in fact, it was the other way around that I remembered um, the stores. I remembered my way around town. I remembered the house, the ride to the house, the shortcuts. I remembered everything intimately, like somewhere that I can literally prove that I'd never been. And I knew where the candy was in the store, like, you know, without even while I was sitting in the parking lot, like, how is that possible? So this was something that reoccurred. And then, so I haven't been to the Inyo Kern, California, but um, a friend, uh, a friend of mine went there and we did a, like a, like a FaceTime, like a Facebook video thing. And he walked up and I was describing things before he got there that he would find rocks and the bridge and the gate, how the gate was and what everything looked like. And so that was a little bit of confidence, you know, and, the things I'm saying are, are very, I understand that they're very hard to believe. The things that we're talking about are very hard to believe. So I take it very seriously that I wouldn't speak publicly if I didn't have a lot of substantiating evidence. I think a lot of people are speaking about the phenomenon now, the secret space program with zero evidence. I, I'm not calling them frauds. I'm just saying that it's important to have evidence because this is a very important, so this is possibly the most important subject to all of mankind right now. And it needs to be believed by people that have the, every right to be skeptical. So you need to support evidence. The other thing is that the geyser on series turned out. I don't know if you're aware of that. Mm -mm. So in 2015, so after I got my memories back, I thought I, I, I wanted help. I wanted counseling. And um, I knew I got in the phone book and I started looking at counselors. And I thought if I go into them with the story, any of them, I'm just going to get highly medicated. They're never, there's going to be no support. This is not this is all, not in their wheelhouse, and so I reached out to researchers in the ufology field, and I got I ended up I wasn't I didn't get therapy, I got researched I got grilled heavily, and I but what was nice about that is that I went on record in 2015 through those years uh through let's see from May June July August September so for, for the next four months. I got extremely grilled. And then it went on for another six months after that. So most of 2015, I got, it was just emails and, and phone calls of really intense questioning that I was getting cross-referenced with other insiders and whistleblowers, unbeknownst to me. And I went on record saying that the white spots on Ceres, there's the O'Cotter crater and the Dawn probe was getting there in 2016. And everybody thought that the lights on Ceres were a, a city or something. I said, no, that's salt. Because I remember flying over that in the ship when the geyser was going off. The geyser goes off randomly every four to six years, and it squirts water into space for about um, 10 kilometers. And the water evaporates, and the leftover salts, like ocean water, the salt and a little bit of magnesium snow back to, back to the surface. And there's actually meters deep of salt right there. And that's what those white spots are. And I said this in 2015. And uh, the Dawn probe got went into orbit and took better pictures, and everybody knew it wasn't. They were wondering what it was, and NASA said it's a chemical cocktail. It did a high altitude survey, and they decided it was sulfur, and a few other things. And so this researcher got back with me and said, "Do you want to change your statement? Do you want to recant your statement, Tony? Because NASA originally thinks that it's it's going to be sulfur and, and phosphorus and a bunch of other compounds, and they're not. They don't even suspect salt." And I said, "No." It's salt. Trust me. I had a conversation. I stood on the deck of a spaceship looking out the window, talking about it down there. And we all were talking about how much salt was there that you could scoop it up and take a nice bath because there was magnesium in it too. It was like an Epsom salt, you know, salt. And I said, no, definitely it's salt. That's if there's one thing I remember about all this. And then at, after that point, I hadn't been to Seattle yet either. So I was not trusting my memories that much, but went on record. 
in August of 2020, NASA concluded they finally finished all the data that got downloaded from the Dawn probe when it went into a lower orbit. It did a real spectral analysis of those, uh, and it was a briny salt. So I was totally confirmed in that. It was something that I held my ground with. And I started getting that morning, the 20th of August, people started emailing me and I said, Tony, guess what? You're just like you said. Yeah. And I was just on cloud nine. It was like, you know, to, to, to speak about this, to speak about the things that we speak about. Um, I get a lot of criticism. I mean, I ain't gonna lie. I've taken my lumps and I'm not complaining about it. I'm just saying that it's a reality that it's every, people have every right to be spectacular. It'd be weird if people weren't skeptical. However, it's also, you know, people are very, can be very uh, aggressive with their skepticism as well and be very uh, insulting about it. So I've taken my lumps, man. And so to have any kind of thing plan out and support my testimony in a way that's evidence is just very special. It's just a very, that was a very special day for me. And it's something that I'm very proud of. After you retrieve these memories, did you notice that you had an improvement or any new cognitive abilities that you didn't have prior? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. What happened was, and I, you know, I don't want to call it a cognitive ability, but what happened was um, during my time, I was greatly abused. I was a slave, point blank. I was greatly abused. And there were times when I was badly injured. So I had forms of PTSD. I, you know, I came back. I was not claustrophobic on that Thursday. And I woke up Friday afraid of small confined places. And I didn't know why. And I had nothing but relationship problems all through my teens and 20s. And I didn't know why. I had no idea why I had emotional problems. And I had no idea why I had PSD, PTSD symptoms, you know. I had no idea why. And I lived with it my whole, my, my twenties, I was a very lonely person and I was very emotionally, um, you know, damaged I, for lack of a better, I don't know the right words. When I got my memories back, I remembered being trapped in a small place and working on a ship that had very tight space. I went, that's why I'm claustrophobic. And it went away. It dispelled it. And the PTSD, I said, that's why when, once I, once I actually had the cause then I was able to dispel it because I had no idea of the size of the, of the trauma, the size of the cause of the problem. And um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, I have, a, I have, my theory is that during those 20 years, there were two of me that were tapping into the same, like you said, the same uh, records, you know, right. what, like you said, that guy said, you, you, you know, your, your memories are non-local that they're, it's your, it's your life. It's, you know, chi, your awareness, your like soul, your whatever self. you want to call it. your higher self. That's right. So one higher self was split between two destinations. And when the other one essentially died, I got back that attention from my higher self. And, you know, I, I tell people, you know, the way to, and it, it did feel like this, this is exactly in a way how it felt that I experienced it is that, you know, cause I was taken, I, when I was taken, I was an outstanding student. I was in, you know, fourth grade. <laughs> But I was in the top 5%. I was straight A's. I was a straight A student. I was an outstanding student. And the next year, I totally withdrew. And I eventually dropped out of school. I was not an outstanding. I was, a, you know, mediocre. And all of a sudden, one day, 20 years later, I woke up in the middle of my life in, in Michigan. I lived in Ann Arbor, I believe, at the time. I woke up one day, 20 years later, and I said, it's over. It's over. And I kept saying it over and over again. It's over. I can't, you know, felt like a million bucks. Up until that point, I couldn't put together a relationship. A few months later, I met my wife, stayed with her ever since, and cleaned my room and got on with my own career and began taking better care of myself and like across the board. It was like, as if I tell people like, you know, there was a five gallon bucket of water and they poured half of it into a different bucket. And at the end of 20 years, they poured it back in that original bucket. And that's what it kind of felt like. Um, so, so yes, to answer your question, I did at the end of, at the end of the 20 years, which was, if you count the days, so this is another thing I did the math. If you count the days of the ships, about eight years of the ship going, leaving in the morning and coming back one day, five and six days a week, randomly, it adds up to two years. So from 1982 to 2000, that day I woke up was in 2000. I did the math. And if you shave off those days on the ship where we did the anti-telephoning, it adds up to about two years. 
So the math of it all worked right out exactly how I remembered it. And it's hard to explain to people, you know, with time travel, when people, humans are not built to, to really um, contemplate time travel that I, I really, I really think that we're limited to it when, when we, because that's where you lose people. Everybody's willing to believe in ETs, consciousness, ESP, spaceships, UFOs. But once you start talking about travel and time, you, you get a thousand yard stare because it's just something we're not equipped to contemplate very well. Have you heard of the term twin flame? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And well, that's something we talk about here, you know, and the, your consciousness being divided again between two bodies and you actually may meet your twin flame here if you have one it's almost like a manufactured twin flame which you experienced yeah um like a like a forced version of it right so yeah i think that there there were a lot of things like i went through an I, i think i went through some experimental programs and it did things to me that are not done to people that are normally taken into the programs so I think, like I said, I was kind of shuffled through a side door and I was, I was an extra that they just threw in. They, they, I wasn't groomed for this and I wasn't meant for it, I, per se. How did your wife and kids handle this once you kind of regained your memories and then started becoming public with it? So the, my children are very supportive. Uh, my wife wanted it all to go away, doesn't want me to speak about it. And wants to not be like I said. We've there's a social price to pay if you're in if you're in uh, if you're an abductee or a witness to the UFO phenomenon in any way, and you speak out publicly about it. There's an automatic programmed stigma, and you are immediately ridiculed. And so we've put up. You know, I've I've taken my lumps. People have, originally I thought I was going to do one interview, and um, that was it. I'd put my, my, I'd say my two cents and it would go into the body of work that people would look at and that would be it. But it didn't work out that way. One interview turned into hundreds. And then the book, I worked on the book for six years and you know, I'm not an author. It was very difficult to write the book. A couple other very talented people helped me out. A girl named Jackie Kenner is a very brilliant, uh, wonderful person, just a, a dynamo and smartest people I've ever met in my life. Really uh, was the reason I got the book done. And, uh, when the book came out, it was number one for six weeks. It was really, it did well. Like there was people wait, there were people waiting for it and it's gotten great reviews and it's been a lot more than I thought was going to happen. All of this, I got way more attention and like, I've been recognized in my own town. I live in a small town and you know, our, our immediate family has found out. I never wanted my mom to find out. My mom found out like people in my life. I thought that I was just going to go on the record and just the ufology community, which is ultimately small, would know, and nobody else would know. And now everybody in my personal life knows. People know it's it affects your professional life. I have to hide my name professionally sometimes. Uh, you know what I mean? Because I'd rather not have it come up when I'm trying to do business with people. You know, in my I have a career. I'm a middle class person. I'm a, I'm a woodworker, and um, you know, and I also have this testimony that I that I. But at the same time, so. My family that didn't want me to talk about it because it did affect them socially. It did ripple down to them in in negative ways. At the same time, I kind of held my ground because I also feel that this information is very important. It belongs to everybody. And it's very important that people know that this happens, that this happened to me. It wasn't wasn't right what happened, that there are organizations that have access to ETs and higher technology. These are people that are living longer than us now because they have so such a you know their lifespan is maybe double or quadruple what ours is because they have access and we don't so there's a there's a crime here and it was very important for me to speak about it and it still is i still will answer anybody that asks can you tell us about some of the ets that you came in contact with Uh, yeah there were two species that lived on series alongside the deutsch people that were basically a german breakaway uh, colony there are ETs that are indigenous on Mars. There are insectoids that are intelligent. There are reptiles that are intelligent. Um, there are people on Mars is a very contested territory. There's quite a lot going on there. A lot of underground cities um, that can't be seen from the surface. Um, we went to other worlds. I we I set foot on other planets throughout the galaxy and beyond, doing trade missions. That was I was a cargo engineer in my last two years, two and a half years up there. 
And we were trading cargo goods for tech and vice versa. And I would set foot on other planets and see ETs. There, I saw ETs that looked like crosses between humans and rats, uh, ETs that were reptilians that were humanoid reptilians, uh, ETs that look just like us, uh, ETs that look just like us, but have bigger heads that are seven, eight feet tall, nine feet tall people uh, with telepathic abilities and different eyes, different arms. There were quite a few. Um, I saw ETs. There was once on a train, I walked onto the train and saw a very advanced um, race that they had a form of jewelry that created a hologram around them, mm -hmm. basically sparkles in the air in between you and them, like a, like a special effect, but it was oh. jewelry. They wore it as jewelry. And when you looked away, you wouldn't see it. You know, if you looked, if, if you looked, if, you know, if I was looking at you, I'd see this effect around them of, of just like rainbow, like crystal, like sparkles in the air as a hologram. And then when you'd look away, you wouldn't see it and you'd look back and it'd be there. And it was just their jewelry. And she was, it was a female. She was in a white silky robe. She was sitting on the train. I was, I was connecting on a train going to see my girlfriend. And I walked on and there was this advanced ET. So the, the series colony had classifications for intelligence and it was based on about the amount of data that you can trade with another consciousness. So think about it like this, all, everything that I'm saying, my words add up to an amount of data that I'm sharing with you. So we can put an amount, you know, you can say that I just gave you, you know, half a gig of information because of everything that I've explained on top. And then you take the visual cues, my body language and that there's an amount of data. Um, so it turned out they had anything that had 150,000 or 200,000 words was considered a person. It could be a, a, a rodent or a bucket of goo. It didn't matter. It was a person at that point. Like that was a level of intelligence. Our animals speak, but less words. So they're a level of under us. And there were other ETs that were telepathic that, you know, had half a million words. And then there were ETs that had 2 million words or video. Basically, when they communicate telepathically, they don't speak in words anymore. They show you event you know a week of memory all in a second so these are great amounts of data that higher higher entities that's how they communicate and that's how they you know they had they had human uh, ultra human uber human meta human uh, and then it went on they had a, they had a chart of of extraterrestrial uh, you know basically intelligence an intelligence chart and there are there are ets that are developed that can communicate an entire year of experience in a few seconds telepathically and that's how they we we kind of don't understand what their life is like at that they have different they have a completely different existence than we do the same way that we have a different existence than a squirrel and so they, this this is a reality out there that and i i think it's a real tragedy for mankind right now that we don't have anything to aspire to we were given religion and we aspired to be more like you know our religious figures of any particular religion and we were given that so that's that's our role model but nowadays people you know it's been such called into question by so many things and bad behavior throughout religions people don't believe it and we're 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 mistakenly think that we're the smartest that it can be that we can be and so people fail to aspire to be better in a way People try to get more things, but they they're not trying to make become mentally better. So many people, most people, I think today. But if we knew about these ETs, if we actually saw them on our TV and we saw there are ETs that can they don't use spaceships anymore because they can just mentally travel great distances. They can mental they can they can rearrange the molecular like you know they can rearrange objects. They can turn something into something else mentally. So we would aspire to behave like them if we were aware of them. We would aspire to change our life and we would guard our thoughts. You know, the the day that we become telepathic, be it mechanically or naturally, is the day that we stop using money the same because everybody has to hide the amount of money they have, how much money they make. Money itself is, is supposed to, the very nature of the finances is to be secretive, right? And so the day that we can all read each other's minds is the day that money doesn't it's going to run out of its purpose because we're going to have to quit lying to each other about everything. We're going to share information. You know, when you can telepathically bump into somebody that's a doctor and learn how to be a doctor in a few minutes, um, you know, money's going to, the, the financial thing's going to go right out the window. 
So we're being purposely held down for that reason. Do you find that the more advanced the race is, the more benevolent they are, or that's just a misconception? So, so we were told, uh, officially, we were told not to worry about it. So we were told, they, they, the series colony, I was a worker, wanted, wanted us to be atheists. They said that that's it. When you die, there's nothing. The light goes out and you're dead. And that's what they wanted because they wanted people that would pull the trigger, uh, you know, for lack of a better term. Uh, you know, they wanted people that would that would not have a moral compulsion to do things, to do certain tasks. But there were people, high ranking people that were all aware that there was a creator, uh, that there is there were higher intelligences and there's a pattern to it. Um, that being said, we were aware that there are very advanced extraterrestrials that are nothing like a benevolent and that there was a certain point where that ran out like they were not the highest like there was a certain point of development it, there's a threshold of technology and there's a certain point where the threshold becomes mental and not technological like in other words your mind their consciousness could affect the hologram in such a way that they don't need technology they don't need a shovel because they could just make the dirt turn into water and flow away so there was a level of that and those were benevolence not the right word um, it just makes sense to um, think of the body of life as a whole. And so on that level, they kind of look at us as part of them as well. Like we're all, the universe is one organism at that point. And it just makes sense to not harm the organism that you are a part of. So it's not that they're benevolent or loving or any way. It's just, it makes the most sense to not destroy us or other, other life forms. Like I, I, I really feel from what I learned up there that the, the the stark contrast of benevolent or malevolent that we think or good and evil that we think is something that is forced upon us i think that all the fiction in our entire life you've always read stories and everybody's always there's a good guy that's always good and a bad guy that's always bad and that's not the case and you know depending on where you're at in the world there are places in the world where they think that all the, the united states is evil and there are people that think the united states is the greatest thing that ever happened their savior and it's neither it's neither. It's just a country. And depending on our our situation is what our actions that we choose. And they may be something that have a, de uh, you know, a benevolent effect or a male malevolent effect, the big words. But do you, you get what I'm saying mm -hmm. by this, that um, that the good and evil thing is way blurrier, way, way more of a gray line than what we ascribe it is and we want we want ets to come down and be our saviors and teach us and hold us by the hand but that's not the case they have their own life and their own and their perspective they don't really need to do that if it makes sense to come down and help us then they will but it's a matter of logic not morals i think you're probably aware of the israeli general that um talked about that there is a galactic federation but one yes. of the things i thought was real interesting that he said was that space is not what you think it is mm -hmm. what does that mean to you well so i don't even want to touch into some of the conspiracy that there's no space and you know whatever the world's flat it's right. a firmament and all, i hate those words and they're buzzwords and it's an iq test <laughs> uh, space is a very vast place the world is round and the sky nature extends beyond the sky um the thing that it is, so again, back to, we've been programmed. I've been doing, this is something that's been a focus of my, in the beginning, I was researching my own memories to pan, make sure that they were real. And so that was the focus of my research. And I actually had people reach out to me to help people like private investigators to look up people and people that were internet hackers that had access to things. And they helped me research my case. And now the focus of research, I'm looking at how the apparatus works. And, um, you know, one, one thing is, is uh, I'm sorry, uh, excuse me if this takes a minute to explain, but please follow me. I, mm -hmm. you know, I've given a great deal of, of time to researching this, but one of the, one of the ways they installed the giggle factor on UFOlogy was the checkout line at the grocery store. So they would have space and then they would have something ridiculous and food and when you're checking out at the line you're you might not realize this but your reptile brain your lower function brain that's you're making the kill you're essentially making the kill mm -hmm. 
and getting your securing your meal for that week, all your food. Mm-hmm. Your so that part of your brain is active, which supersedes and bypasses the, your higher reasoning. So it goes into your subconscious. And what they had there was the the National Enquirer and these absurd stories. The king's a reptile, the queen's a reptile, and they had all these horrible stories that are just absurd that you would laugh at. And it just passes in right past your cognitive thinking and into your subconscious because that part of your brain, you're making your kill. It's like that's the time that we as we used to be hunter gatherers, but now the closest thing we do is pay for our food. And it's right at that moment in the grocery store. And if you saw that there for a while, now they've strangely, they've reversed all that. There's no more space in UFOs there anymore. And, uh, but media also, so I look back and it's like, and I thought Hollywood, the, not so much the writers or the actors or the directors, but the special effects people are showing us glimpses of actual secret tech. We're seeing a little bit of truth in every movie. So there's de- deniability. If you say that you were taken and you went to Mars and you saw bugs, giant bugs, then they go, ah, oh, well, you saw this movie and that's, you're just whatever you're imagining this movie. So it's plausible deniability. And I thought, when did this happen? And when I look at the corporate structure of a lot of film studios and really back in the thirties, they were having, they began with uh, a lot of the, a lot of real similar things to actual what's, what's in our solar system in space it was the late thirties and forties. So they've been doing, Hollywood's been in the know all along or, or elements of Hollywood, excuse me, not, like I said, not necessarily. And when you look at the corporate structure, like in the late 30s, they these big entities started buying out film companies from their creators back then. Do you think that they're slowly disseminating this information to us for programming or actually to help us prepare for the. It's so that we don't worry about it. It's so that we don't worry about it. So it's true that we all share uh, outside of the quantum hologram, back to the quantum hologram, when you go to sleep and your body, you, you, you get into a, a REM sleep, you begin to access the quantum field and we all begin, we all in a way communicate with each other subconsciously. So the people that are in space are also communicating with us and the secret would disseminate into our subconscious in that way. And so people would wake up dreaming about being in space or experiencing these societies that are in our solar system, these colonies, and people would go, wait, what is that? So our subconscious would lead us to discover them. So what they did was they gave the movies there. They show us those in the movies so that your subconscious can be tricked and it's kind of satisfied in a way to not look any further. That's what these movies are. That's exactly the reason. It's because on, on a subconscious level, we are all very connected. That being said, I went back and fast forward in the, from the 30s and 40s to when all these corporations took over Hollywood. And you look at our version of space, and this is back to your question. Um, space is far away. If you get into space, like in Star Wars or Star Trek, and you actually want to fly to the next star, it takes a long time to get there. The bad guy is always bad. He's more powerful than the good guy. And the good guy is always good, but he's bungling and poor and starving. And space is just far. Just you can't even get to the other side. If we went to like and started, if we went to the other side of the galaxy, it'd be 80 years. So space is very, very far. And it's a neighborhood is only like a dozen people that we talk to. And you know, you've got this corralled picture of space through across the, all the medium. When in reality, these programs can access other galaxies, trillions of worlds, trillions of other species that are all in contact with each other for trade. They're there's a bullet, there's a space station, a trading space station near Jupiter that has access to information, like a bulletin board for people, for other planets. When they say, look, we want to trade, we're available to trade. So they're on this bulletin board with literally billions of worlds listed on this bulletin board. So you can go there and send a message. And go, we want to trade too. Can we meet you? And can we, can we enter your system? Because this is what we used to do on my ship. We would go to this base and we'd get a list of you know, 20 destinations, and that would be our week. And then we'd go back the next week and do it again. And we'd go to these worlds and contact them. We had a, a sample package of packages, you know, of small boxes, you know, eight eight or nine boxes so, or so that had samples of things that we had available to trade, plants, spices, technologies, medicines. And we would offload these and we'd come back a week later and see if they were interested in any. And they would give us some. And this is how trade happened. This is what's going on up there. And there are, we're talking billions of worlds that are accessible through this 
station. There's one of these stations near all of the wormholes, all the natural portals in the galaxy. There's one of these stations that has a trading, you know, uh, a bulletin board. And so space is not only nearby accessible, but it's not just a few dozen worlds. It's not 90 species. It's not 500 species. It's a trillion. When you look at when you look at the UFO phenomenon, you begin to study cases globally. The world is actually cut up into so the United States tends to be military and a certain a certain set of species that interact with us. A person that's an abductee describes the same tend to describe the same level of technology and the same entities, the same beings. But when you go around the world, there there are places like Australia, Europe, um, Africa, South America. You go to places where they're describing different phenomena. The same exact thing, but different levels of technology. Some play, some people are taken by ETs that look differently and have radically advanced technology compared to somebody that was taken by a gray ET that was in a physical room or on a ship. So there are different levels that we're being interacted with, not by a dozen species, but by possibly trillions of species can access us and go home in the same day. We didn't stay in space either. At the end of the day, I went right back to my room. It was a day at the office. And I went to five or six different systems, worlds, and sometimes other galaxies. And I would come home and I would be home in the afternoon. Hmm. So that's the reality of space. That's what Hollywood does not give us. Are there any movies or television shows that mostly resemble what you encountered out there? No, that's a great question. You know, uh, other than the ships. So uh, the, there's, there's no rocket ships. They weren't rockets. There were disks. And there were um, kind of pie-shaped craft and triangles, but they were smooth. The other thing is when you look at like the Star Wars, the battle cruiser, the the Empire, you know, how they have all these square edges and you know all these protrusions. They were smooth. Our ships were smooth, and they were concerned with radar the same way that we are now. That we we had stealth because we were interacting with lesser advanced worlds where we could sneak in there and plunder them. So radar evasion was was real was a was it was a uh, a thing but that being said the closest to the uh i saw a lot of things that are like that were very realistic in the the show the expanse uh season one they had they even had series i was shocked i was like jaw dropping the very first episode they showed series colony they're on series like it like it's in the future but they showed inside series and there were some scenes in there that were freakishly close to the real thing with what i remember but my you know i even had artists it's luckily i had artists work on some things before that show came out that you know that i saw that that i saw it so it was nice you know luckily it's not a show that came out and then i described it so that i was deniable but i i described it had artists draw a street scene on series before that show aired so um the similarities are crazy we get a little bit in every show is what it is. They give you they give you a half of percent of truth in every sci-fi show, and then the rest is a story. And then the next one gives you a different half of percent. So you get you're getting the truth, but it's in a manner to pacify your subconscious, our collective subconscious. We're pacified by these. So and it's not even because we all kind of work as one mind. We we communicate on a high when we're in a higher focus state outside of the hologram. We communicate much more rapidly. We get permission from each other for things that are going to happen in the future. We have, you know, there's a lot of science behind this. I'm not just shooting from the hip. Um, but we communicate. And those, so the people that went into space were very aware because they were dealing with ETs that have already had to deal. We're not the first world that has made it to our level of development. They know exactly what's going to happen. They knew exactly what was going to happen when the internet came out. They know exactly what's going to happen with with the phones and like with all the, this has all happened on other worlds and they've controlled it. So they knew what was going to happen when they began to put colonies on Mars and on the moon and on Ceres and around Saturn. They when they began to colonize, they knew that the subconscious, the collective subconscious of mankind, would be aware and want to know and discover it. So they pacified us with our entertainment, and we are that's kind of lends to the term sleeping because our, our subconscious goes ah well at least we can watch it on the movie so we, we're kind of okay you guys go ahead and have fun you know like that's kind of what you're doing subconsciously and it's working do you still find yourself still getting or still retrieving me new memories that you haven't before and also do you still have contact with any of these species during your dreams 
Wow. So a couple of great questions. So yes, I still remember things all the time, but it's always something minor. Um, I'm always having people ask me questions and I go, wait a minute. What, what did we think of mostly about the, so I was a slave. So I did not have a phone. I did not have access to the, to the, to the network up there. I only knew what people water cooler talk. Basically, I only knew the rumors. So when people ask me questions, I think about things that I heard that, you know, sort the talk and that comes back to me. So I'm always remembering some of that. Some of those conversations come back. Are they relevant or not? And, um, but I don't remember a whole lot of new stuff anymore. Like most of the bulk of it, I, I'd like to think that I've got 80% of my memories of that time. And when you talk, talk about remembering a 20 year period of time, it's, it's very daunting to do for anybody for you to remember, you know, think about where you were from the time you were 10 until you were 30. What'd you do? Could you tell me that real quick? <laughs> so <laughs> that's what it's like. So there's that. And then I've made attempts through meditating to, to contact. So I don't know, to be honest, I, to be absolutely honest, I don't know. I like to think that I made some friends out there that are, I would, I'd like to think that, I couldn't have made it as far as I have with all these interviews. I'm doing speaking engagements. I travel. I do live talk. The book has been a bestseller. Another book coming out. My own show. I have a Patreon show. My website. All these things. I'm not, I, like I said, I'm a woodworker. That's the extent of my skills. And uh, all these things happened. And I got to feel like, you know, I've had help along the way. When do you think we're going to have full disclosure? We will never have full disclosure. And by that, I mean full disclosure, because even the people that are doing the secretive, keeping it secret, are unaware of everything, for one. So, and that's just a play on words, because you said full disclosure. So I just want to, but disclosure, um, to me, disclosure is access to their network. So there's an interstellar, intersolar system internet that has access to other internets in other star systems. So there's a body of knowledge that tells us all about a lot of the life out there. That's what disclosure is going to be to me. Like for them to tell us that there are extra, a extraterrestrial life, bacterial or fish or whatever it is, is a lie. And then if we get contacted, I think that once it happens, it'll happen quickly that we'll get, we'll get a human version. So there are many planets that have humans. They have nothing to do with our planet. So we're, we're, we're not the most common species, but we are throughout the, nearby cosmos there are human worlds that are free that are nothing like ours that live in a different um, way so i think we'll get some of those that visit us first and that'll be the knowledge of what's going on up there they'll give us a sanitized version of why they had to cover it up and then over time they'll disseminate the information very slowly and i hope that we don't end up in some kind of totalitarian situation where our leaders are you know, spoon feeding us instead of giving us the info and letting like we need a we need a, a free society to access these things while it shapes because, like I said, once we get some positive role models, um, the behavior the collective behavior of people is going to change greatly. Once we find out we're not alone, that there's actually a great deal of of potential that we are unaware of for our for our day to day lives. Like people will start to aspire to be better, and the world will quickly follow suit so i think a lot of things that cause problems a lot of, a lot of the pain that people pass on because they've experienced it will go away within a generation after a disclosure event um you know and i'm an optimist i'm always an optimist but i think we are going to get a disclosure event very soon i think within the next five years that we're going to learn about life out there and Quickly after that, we'll learn about intelligent life, or it may all just happen at once. I think once it happens, what'll what'll happen is it'll come so quickly that nobody can question it and go, wait a minute, you guys were breaking the law all that time? You guys wait a minute, because the in the time that you say that, an avalanche of more information will come. And I think once that happens, it'll happen so quickly that everybody's everybody's trepidation will get buried inside of the awe of the the real scale of everything. But I think that that's one good way for them to do that is just to bombard us with so much information that nobody has time to question anything. And it'll be a hundred years before we look back and go, wait, those guys were breaking the law. Do you think that we'll get to a point where there will be ETs walking around here on earth and interacting with us? And will openly. we have, openly and will we get to a point where we have like a Star Trek type society? I absolutely believe that it's not if it's when. 
I absolutely do believe that ETs are already among us and they're just, it's just a secret, but they're already down here and they're already interacting with us. They have been the whole time. That's what I mean. When you look at the phenomenon of the secret space program, like it's a, it's been a hundred years that, that our governments have had access, but there have been secret space programs the whole time. It's been the whole time, the tech, the, the advanced consciousness technology and flipping that around the time travel, the AI, it's been here the entire, the entire uh, history of mankind. We've been, there have been people that had access to these things. There have been other beings that have access to these things that have been down here. When you look at the big events uh, that happen in history, it's because they've been here the whole time serving their own interests. And we, we've been a great resource. Uh, people are, people are amazing. I want to let people know again, the title of your book is called Series Colony Cavalier. Can we find it on your website or Amazon or both? Sure, absolutely. So my website is TonyRodriggs.com. It's Rodriggs with an S, G-U-E-S at the end. TonyRodriggs.com has a link to my Patreon show. I have a small audience, but I do a Patreon show where I interview people, other people like me. And I moved it because they deleted a lot of my stuff off YouTube, you know, controversial stuff. I've even had a few Patreons deleted, but that's the whole reason I put a paywall so it wouldn't get censored and it keeps the trolls out. Um, but I have a link to the book on there. The book is on Amazon. It did really well. Uh, have, I'm very proud of the reviews of the book. That to me, that's like a, a big thing. So the people leave awesome reviews. But it's series with a C, C-E-R-E-S, Series Colony Cavalier. It's on Amazon and it's off my website, TonyRodericks.com. And then I do consultations for people. A lot of people feel after they hear, hear my information that they've experienced something similar. And so many of them came that I couldn't keep up with it. So I added a consult fee so that it would kind of thin out because I just don't have time for everybody. And I do those on there and you can email me and there are links to a lot of free interviews off my website as well. So that's there, but um, yeah, check out the book on Amazon. A lot of people, I think it's very eye opening, and the book really is, is an account. And when you think, I, say, I would say this to anybody that's hearing this for the first time, that's giving me the benefit of the doubt without being turned off. A, the book is difficult to read. There was torture. There were bad things. So it's an adult book. Um, but B, the entirety of that book came to me in a few hours of memories like this, you know, like it came all like the bulk of it. That's the amount of memories that came through. So I would say that that was what I experienced. So there's no way that that happens in a flash of creativity. Just there's no way it was just too much. So, um, and then, like I said, the things that I've researched since then, before we finish up, uh, do you have anything else you're working on that you want us to know about? Um, I'm going to the Galactic Spiritual Informers Convention in Orlando. There's some uh, other people in the space, you know, Dr. Sala. I'm a big fan of him. Elena Denon will be there. Mm -hmm. Alex Collier, mm -hmm. John Charles Moyen, a good friend that I've just met recently, Chris O'Connor. He's got an amazing story. So there's a lot of people that are going, Laura Eisen will be there on and on and on. Mm -hmm. I'm going to that next month, and I'm working on the second book. And I've been consulting people. So there's a movie script that's a fiction script based on my experiences. It's gone out. And there's a book, there's a fiction, like a, like an action sci-fi series of books that's being made that I'm on. I'm kind of, I'm not writing it, but I'm the advisor kind of thing. And I'm excited about that. I might, we may end up promoing that through my Amazon account. I'm not sure yet, but it's in the works. And like the second book, really the, the first book had a lot of questions that people ask and there's a spirituality side of it things that i've learned since i wrote the book kind of and there was just things that i you know the first book i had i worked on it for six years so it was like i had to get get it done now or never and i kind of barnstormed it so there's a lot missing out of the book and so the second book is to it's going to wants to fill all that in there's kind of a reveal at the end so i'm working on that i'm hoping to get it out inside of three or four months it just depends i'm gonna not rush the editing like this, this last book got rushed and it rightly so because everybody had been waiting for it. And was like, I, I felt like if I didn't get it out, I'd never finish it. Mm -hmm. So I just, I said, no, I got to do it. I got, you know, you can correct, you can keep painting your painting for the rest of your life. And that's what this was. So now this is done. I'm going to edit really. Um, uh, but the second book is, is a different animal altogether. It's not so much a linear story. It kind of jumps around the 20 years, you know, back and forth of how they're, how they're related. And I'm trying to figure out if I had ET help all along. Tony, one more thing before you go. Can you leave us with one last positive message? Uh, 
I, there's a ton. And I'll say this, that, you know, the thing that I learned was to, you know, when I started, when I got my memories back and I was offered to speak publicly about it, the first thing I felt was fear. Am I going to be killed for this? And I hate, I, at that time, in 2016, it was the end of 15, 2016. At that time, there was a day when I thought to myself, this is important for people to know. And I can't live live my life being afraid. So whatever happens is going to have to be somebody else's problem, not mine. I'm not going to be afraid to go and tell the truth of that I know. And it changed my entire life because I quit being afraid of everything. Mm -hmm. Letting go of fear really was really was life changing. It really was. I let go of the false carrot and stick thing. I let go of a lot of things that were keeping me unhappy. And I found out I was happy and I didn't need much to be happy. And just not being afraid every time I turned around. Other memories, now that I'm writing the second book, there are things that I remember during those flights in Peru when I was put brought near to death. There were near-death experiences that are very spiritual. And the thing I learned all along, and I say this, and I, I truly believe this, I truly believe this, is that at the end of it all, there's nothing to be afraid of. Like nothing. Like you, the end of the world, the end of the universe, the black hole crushing us, all of those are just a false thing to get you to grow quicker. But at the end of the trail, your soul has zero to be afraid of. Everything is just fine. And that's what I feel. I really do feel that. And um, however, if we get a negative enslaving disclosure from our reptilian overlords, it's only a matter of time till things work out in our favor. So you, know, you can pick a, a bumpy road or a smooth road, but either way, you're going to get to where you're going. We're going to be just fine. Tony, thank you for that message. And thank you again for joining me. I appreciate you, and I hope we get you back when you release your next book. Absolutely. I'd love to come back. All right. Thanks, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks. You too. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.